Welcome to Offscreen. Let's get cinematic as ever on your couch. We are keeping you here with your seven-day guide to everything movies. How you doing, Van? I'm all good, Bex. How's things on your end? I'm fine. I'm fine. I think we need to drop a little boom in there, but uh, we're all good. Um, it's been an. It's it's not the most romantic week of movies, I'd say. Whoa, um, whoa, whoa. I mean, clearly you're not trying to romance someone like me because, oof, I'm, I'm an easy lay for the movies out this week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me say, not traditionally, there's no rom-coms that we've got for you this week. We're going a little bit rogue. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, it does be honest, if, you, if you're trying to romance me for Valentine's Day, it, it ain't going to take a rom-com. There's no great love story needed. All you need to do is enchant me with with tales of companionship and overcoming adversity in in triumphant circumstance. Uh, so, on, on which note, should we talk about the Tom Hanks Western and the and the Nicolas Cage versus Furries movie? Well, I was going to say the Nicolas Cage versus Furries movie is probably right up your street, and you're like, that is my Valentine's Day watch done and dusted. <laughs> but we'll start with News of the World, which is garnering some awards. Um, you know, there's some nods that are coming out left, right, and centre from the south the Golden Globes, you know, not as many as maybe Paul Greengrass and Tom Hanks would like, but nevertheless, mm. you are um, you are still seeing that this is a really solid movie and something worth taking note. So to give you guys a little bit of an insight into what it's about, Tom Hanks basically plays a guy who delivers the news of the day in the West. It's set five years uh, past the Civil War. Um, mm. And essentially what happens is he stumbles across a 10 year old girl that's been taken by the Kiowa tribe, uh, a Native American tribe, and he wants to return her to her aunt and uncle across the terrible and harsh plains of Texas. But what, what did she say? She said you've been calling her the wrong name. Her name's Cicada. Well, it's Johanna now. Johanna Leonberger. Miss Ma'am? Do we go by Keith? Do we go by Keith? Do we go by Keith? She says she got no home. No Kiowa family, neither. You see the hair? They cut it when they're in mourning. This child is an orphan twice over. I, I know you you don't necessarily agree with me wholeheartedly on this, Bex, because as, as you said to me, you, you're not a fan of, of Westerns generally. Uh, I thought this was absolutely brilliant. I, I really had a great time with this. Mm -hmm. um, I, there is a common criticism, and I know, I, th I think you share this as well, uh, a criticism that it is quite slow, that it mm. is quite, that, that, it's, that it's uninvolving. I, I, I have to say, I didn't experience that at all. Now, first and foremost, the obvious selling point of the movie is it is the reunion. It's the Captain Phillips reunion. You've yeah. got the director and star of, Kath, of, of Catherine Phillips. Captain <laughs> Phillips back together. Catherine Phillips is the gender <laughs> flip <different> reboot. <laughs> that's, that's the reboot. That's the Melissa McCarthy reboot where she's the <laughs> captain now. And yeah, anyway, <laughs> I don't know why she's captain. But anyway, uh, Ghostbusters. That's why I did a gender flip. There we go. With Melissa McCarthy in my head. That's why. Wouldn't it be Kristen Wiig? Wouldn't that make more sense? Never mind. Anyway, Paul Greengrass and Tom Hanks are back together. No Barkad Abdi this time. Uh, instead, you've got, I'm trying to remember the name of the little girl, Helena Zengel. Yeah. Who I didn't recognize her from anything, but I thought was absolutely tremendous. This yes. little girl who's not so much mute, so much as I think she talks in the Kiowa dialect for, yeah. most, for, for, for most of the screen time. I think there's a teensy bit of English starts to creep in as she spends more time with Hanks. Um, she's the post, she's literally the face on the poster for the movie System Crasher. Uh, which I haven't seen yet. I know Matt Turner was a very big, uh, very big uh, out, uh, advocate of it. Um, I think she's great, but of course, you know, you're going to a Tom Hanks movie. It's Hanks's movie. Uh, being a Paul Greengrass movie, though, I mean, obviously Hanks is amazing. This is him in full older years, uh, John Wayne mode. Mm. I think this is this is when John Wayne was getting to the we past his action prime when he was getting into. I still want to do westerns, but now it's time to do the drama. This is yeah. this is now my my Oscar season going. Away. Um, the, there is that going for it, and I think they add a layer of authenticity around that by surrounding him by with largely unknowns. And there are a few faces in there that you recognise. Uh, Elizabeth Marvel, you'd have heard in the clip, uh, who, funnily enough, has never been in a Marvel movie. Yeah. Feels like an oversight. Uh, Bill Camp's in there as well. I forget the name, but he's one of the villains from Sons of Anarchy, who, uh, who who turns at one point. I thought he was turns at one point early on. I thought he was very good as well. There are just 
little pop, occasional faces that you might recognize from a cable drama you watch something like that, but it is mostly unknowns. Uh, for me, the sticking point is Greengrass's direction, the production design, and some surprisingly impressive visual effects, which are so good, you don't even actually realize they're visual effects in the same way you didn't with Wolf of Wall Street, oh. where it's actually just really good compositing. I wondered if they'd use the Mandalorian stagecraft technology for it, but obviously they didn't. Um, I, I, I just thought it was an incredibly well-crafted, well-designed film, but I really loved it, and I like the episodic nature of it. I like the way that it is going from town to town, and it does create this sort of chapter-like structure of it. I would have taken it a step further and literally had chapter markers on the screen, or at least had the place yeah. name as a sort of chapter thing on the screen. Um, I thought it was very good. Having said that, I'm, I was going into a Western drama. I was going into an episodic Western drama, you know, uh, that is about this this relationship between your know, stalwart curmudgeon kind of thing and and you know little girl that you can't communicate with. And I I was sufficiently impressed by it. I thought it was a really strong, really solid film. Yeah, and I think look, take it for what it is, and you will enjoy. It. I've not got any criticisms in terms of the way it's made, the way it looks, the way it's acted, anything like that. It comes down to a taste for the genre. There are Western fans, and there are non-Western fans. There are horror fans, there are non-horror fans, you know? And I, unfortunately, I struggle with Westerns because of the pace in general. I struggle with it because you kind of know what you're gonna get out of a Western. It's very hard to feel surprised. And actually, you know, this is, I can understand why this is picking up a number of awards across award season, and mm. I don't doubt that at all, but I also can see why it's not running away with the awards. Um, so, of course, yeah. Yeah. And so, like, I was asked this morning by the wonderful Julia Hartley Brewer on the show when I reviewed it this morning. She said, oh, this sounds like something that is going to win Best Cinematography. And she was like, that's where I sit this within my sort of realm. And I was like, I kind of get where she's coming from with that. Like, because she's, she's, it's lacking for her initially the oomph to kind of go this has got the the excitement of captain phillips it doesn't have that excitement for me or even the born trilogy or or you know anything else that paul greengrass has brought us so great caliber great kind of performances overall it does everything that it should but if you're not a western fan this won't be for you. Having said that, I, I, before before we move on, I, I can I can see the points absolutely, sure. um, and I do agree. Yes, you need a, a natural inclination to westerns. Um, uh, on just to touch on Julia's point, statistically speaking, she's actually wrong. This wouldn't win best cinematography, even though I actually think it should be a candidate. It would, however, just judging by history, win best adapted screenplay for seemingly no reason other than the fact that it's half decent and it's based on a thing. And it has Tom Hanks and Paul Greengrass. You know, you know what she means by that is that it's not going to win the major ones. It's going to win the ones yeah. that you're going to go. Oh yeah, okay, I could see why that one's won that. Yeah, yeah. Look, that's overall, that's that. thumbs. I, yeah, I was going to say overall positive. I give it one and a half thumbs. I enjoyed it. It's yeah. just not for me, and I'm happy to say that. Sometimes they're not going to be. That is a stronger rating from you than I expected. I thought we were talking about a single digit there, Vex. Yeah, I Look, I, there's nothing wrong with it. It just doesn't float my boat yeah. or my. Well, I, I, I say I, uh, I, I look forward to watching that again. I think uh, uh, down the line when it when it sort of hits the the home end cycle, I think I'll watch it again. Mm. Uh, but it is. I, I will watch it on a Sunday afternoon though, just to feed your point. Well, there you go. It's available now on Netflix anyway, so you guys can check it out. Um, I'm not sure if it is your ultimate. Oh, exactly. Why am I? Why am I talking about the home end circuit when it's on Netflix? I know. <laughs> it's already I, on the home end circuit. I thought I'd just correct you because that's my job, Van. Connor, you know, it's just That's to make sure right. you're kept in check. Now, talking so about keeping good. it in check, there is going to be no keeping in check with our next offering because even just by the, <laughs> the, the poster, the title, and the star, this is something that maybe I wish I'd watched instead of News of the World. Um, but let's find out, Van. What's Willy's Wonderland all about? Have you not seen Willy's Wonderland? No, I didn't have time. Did I, did, I thought I, I, I know I gave you the. Okay, right. So, okay, first of all. This is the latest Nicolas Cage vehicle. Now, bear in mind, this is going to be the year of Cage this year. I think we're going to have six Nicolas Cage projects out this year by the time we get done, um, including one in which he's literally going to be Joe Exotic. So I'm over the moon. Another in which wait. he's going to be Nicolas Cage. For me. <laughs> but um, so this is Nicolas Cage is a mute drifter. What? Okay. Drivers on muscle doesn't have a single line of dialogue in the no. whole movie. But, no, he doesn't. This is Nicolas Cage acting for night for 88 minutes, right? It's only an 88-minute long film. 
Okay. It is uh, directed by uh, Kevin Lewis. He's adapted a short by uh, Geo Parsons. Uh, of the, I think it was at the same time. I think it was Wally's Wonderland where it was a short. They've changed it for copyright reasons later on. Basically, you know what Chuck E. Cheese is? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, where they have the animatronic furries. Yeah. Nicholas Cage is a mute drifter whose car breaks down in a strange small town, and in order to pay for the repairs, he is hired by the owner of a local derelict family Chuck E. Cheese restaurant, kind of styled like Chuck E. Cheese, called Willy's Wonderland. There is a wonderful Willy's Wonderland t-shirt that goes with it, by the way, that I am absolutely buying the hell out of. Um, and he is told, Do you know what? If you can if you can you know get through the night, just tidy this place up for me, we'll sort everything, you can move on your way. However, there's always a Faustian bargain being struck. Nothing could be that easy. And it turns out the animatronics that run this particular family eatery are in fact evil and have a, have sentience and a mind of their own. And before you know it, it's a mute Nicolas Cage versus animatronic furries. Out of there, partner. My name is Tex, same as the state. Got the handle Macadoo. Welcome to Willie's Wonderland. Yeah, he don't talk much. And I respect that. I enjoy a man a few words. Well, business is not what it used to be, but I am fixing to reopen make Willie's better than ever. Here's my offer. You spend the night cleaning Willie's Wonderland, and I will pay to have your car fixed. By morning tomorrow, you come out of there, and your ride will be ready for you right there. Deal? Why? Is he mute? Why does he have to be it, mute? It kind of adds to the charm of this. This has a real old school 70s grindhouse feel, but at the same time it is, I mean, there's, there's an obvious comparison point here with the very popular video game or cross-platform media series now, uh, for, uh, Five Nights at Freddy's, which is actually in the process of becoming a movie. So this has made that a lot more difficult. Yeah. And it's very obvious very early on in the film that they do not give the, the, the faintest fig about copyright on, on that front. So they're just going with their own thing. I, I will say, look, it's 88 minutes. It's an unknown director who's not really done much for like a decade. Based on a short, it's got Nicholas Cage in it. He's a mute drifter. There's animatronics. You know what you're getting for 88 minutes. Yeah. And I feel very, very confident in myself. I, I, I think I, I can I can judge your opinion in advance by saying. If ever you are in the market to, you know, delve through the, the sphere, the, the litany of films in which Nicolas Cage curb stomps a seven foot tall animatronic gorilla against a urinal, this will be the best of the bunch that you find. <laughs> <laughs> Take take from that what you will, okay? Just take what I have just said. Curve stomping a seven foot tall animatronic gorilla against a urinal by a mute Nicolas Cage. If that's something that you think sounds amusing, this is the movie for you. If it doesn't sound amusing, you are not going to be amused by anything in this film. It just sounds intriguing and it sounds oh so 2021 right now. As well. Oh, it is. Oh, it is. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm sold. I want to watch it. It's 88 minutes that I... I will make time to watch uh, just because it's the features of Chuck E. Cheese. Um, so, uh, what were you? What? How many thumbs are you going to give this? Oh, I'm giving it two because I was really on board with this. I am the guy that finds the animatronic gorilla being curb stomped against a urinal by a mute drifter, Nicholas Cage, trying to get his car repaired by spending the night in a haunted restaurant. To be quite an intriguing prospect. I think you should get that on your t-shirt, not just the t-shirt that's selling. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. I'll, I'll get that to replace my for your consideration the Meg Outstanding Achievement in Blockbuster Cinema or whatever that award yes. was t-shirt that I had made. Brilliant. Uh, right, there we go. That is two very, very different movies that are available for you on digital as your new releases. Coming up next, we're going to take you through your seven-day guide to everything movies on your telly box. Welcome back to Off Screen, and of course, welcome back to the couch. Where else would you be? So we might as well give you some entertainment. Shall we? Uh, shall, we shall we start on? Uh, funnily enough, on Saturday, the thirteenth uh, of February. Yeah. With uh, shall, shall we go back in time for a little retro tech? A little bit. To, let's go back to the mid nineties, shall we? Um, and you know, the mid nineties is kind of. It's Sandra Bullock territory, isn't it? Um, in my mind. Uh, Sony Movies, um, 6.45pm uh, on Saturday night is The Net. Uh, Sandra Bullock ter territory in her finest. Um, she plays Angela Bennett, a computer programmer mm -hmm. who stumbles across 
government secrets. That she, and then she finds herself on the run from an unknown enemy hell bent on destroying her. Exciting. Of course. Though. But that's the thing, of course, as well. There is this added element where I think it's Jeremy Northam is the, uh, the the government spook, the man in black, who's out to get her as well. But he also happens to be her dream man. Captain America meets Albert Schweitzer. Spends all day dashing into fray while making world safe. Democracy at night, playing Bach cantatas, while curing cancer. Settle for a guy who puts the seat down. <laughs> Listen, Angel, you're dreaming. You're one of us. We accept you. We accept her. You're one of us. One of us. I think you'd be forgiven if you've, in the last couple of years, seen official secrets with the Kira Knightley one, <laughs> kind of thinking it follows the same tax, but in the 90s. Well, actually, that's it, but this is actually closer to uh, Enemy of the State yeah. from uh, 90, yeah, this, which sort of plays for opposite genders. This came out, though, at a very specific time for technology and films. There were a lot of films around 95, specifically, which is the year the net came out. Uh, there were a lot of films coming out around that point that dealt with the then emerging threat of the internet and cyberspace, which, as evidenced by the net, which is a perfectly good, perfectly enjoyable thriller, you know, it was one of the first big Sandra Bullock projects. It was, I think it was this and While You Were Sleeping were her mm. first two big solo ones after she broke out with uh, Demolition Man and Speed back to back. She then gets While You Were Sleeping, I think the net comes after that. This was, I think this was Easter 1996 in the UK. I think we got this, if memory serves. So I think I was in Q8 at the time. Um, but it's it's very obvious that nobody involved in the, in the writing of this movie bothered to ask anybody in the industry any kind of questions whatsoever. As you can hear from the clip, that's just how they thought we were all going to be talking on the internet with yeah, uh, okay. a bad voice. I love it about that. Your messages. I love that though, because it's it's like you know we always try and predict the future in movies and stuff, and how mm. wrong you can get it is makes it more endearing, doesn't it? What, Again, you look at the, the, those films that came out with this, and there's like Hackers, for instance. Yeah. Uh, I think Lawnmower Man 2 was around that time. Uh, you had Strange Days, which was the James Cameron, Catherine Bigelow one with Ray Fiennes, where it was, and you had Johnny Mnemonic uh, with, with Keanu Reeves. Keanu Reeves. Yeah. There was a bunch of these, and they were all like 95, early 96. But you know why that is? They were waiting for like the Y2K bug to kick in and like everything to melt down, and then this is how we kind of build ourselves back up again, right? I don't think we were smart enough as a society to know about Y2K by really? that point. I don't, think, I don't think we learned about Y2K until like late 98, it seems to, seems to be in my memory. But uh, the net, re- I say, it's a really good solid thriller. It did yeah. get a sort of direct DVD sequel. Sony went through a phase in about 2004, 2005. Sony landed the rights to this. Uh, it was, I think it was made in Columbia. Sony themselves released a direct DVD uh, sequel to it. There was also a short-lived TV spin-off that I think aired on Sci-Fi in the UK. Neither were particularly any good. They certainly weren't a patch on the film. Because, again, it's the star power of, you know, Sandra Bullock, even in, in her younger years, playing a nerd, which she's not particularly brilliant at. She's better at the runny, jumpy, fugitive stuff. But she's still got that charm. She's still well, the lady from While You Were Sleeping. She's still enchanting us. She's very likeable. So that's on Sony Movies um, on Saturday at 6.45. Well worth your time from 1995. Now, Sunday, when I was doing this list, I was like, we've got to have something for fun for the family. And you'd think Sunday being Valentine's Day, we'd pick something really romantic. But no, we wanted to pick monsters. And we wanted boo. And we wanted fun. And we wanted a university. What have we got? Well, you- you could argue that you skipped romance and gone straight to bromance with yeah. this one because this is the story. This is Monsters University. This is the story of how Mike Wazowski and is it James P. Sullivan, I think is yeah. his name, yeah. um, met for the very first time at uh, MU, Monsters University, you know, in, in the scare program, learning how to be, you know, uh, you know university educated. Uh, yeah, scaremongers. And of course, they don't like each other to begin with. The idea of this being the prequel to Monsters Incorporated, which apparently is the 
official title. Apparently, you're not supposed to call it Monsters Inc. You're supposed to say it as Monsters Incorporated. And spell it. Like... Yeah, exactly. Write it out then. Write it out as Monsters. If you want me to say, I'm not doing your job for you. I'm not doing it. No. <laughs> I do love these movies, though. I think they are really fun. And it's perfect. Look, it's on BBC One at four o'clock on Sunday. I mean, that's perfect time. If you've got the kiddies in tow and you don't know what mm. to, you know, you want to introduce them to, you know, the, the sort of time in which we kind of grew up watching these kind of movies, then I think, you know, you can't go wrong with Monsters University. It's got still the same awesome. charm from the first one. Great performances. Really fun. Yes. Now, funnily enough, the performances for me are what always stand out about uh, Monsters University because it did have a hell of a cast yeah. that the first one didn't so much have because cable comedy wasn't really in the shape it is now when the first one came out, but it was by the time we got the second because that was this was only 2013. This was only eight years ago. Yeah. So, you know, we had our 30 Rocks and our, uh, our Parks and Recreations and things like that. And you look at the cast on this, which includes Aubrey Plaza, uh, Bobby Moynihan from Saturday Night Live, Charlie Day from It's Always in Philadelphia, um, I think Noah Johnston's in there, Dave Foley, Sean Hayes, I think even Helen Mirren, I think, turns up in this. Yeah. But, of course, it's about the returning trio. You get the, the main pairing of Billy Crystal and John Goodman back, and they, as you say, great performances, they just spark off one another. They do. Uh, and, of course, you've got Steve Buscemi returning as Randall. Is it Randall? I think he's Randall from uh, Monsters, Inc., uh, who's just a great slimy Steve Buscemi guys just what would happen if Steve Buscemi was a lizard yeah you know if you could somehow transmogrify Steve Buscemi to become a lizard and you still retain the ability to talk you just that's have what you're gonna get yeah yeah absolutely. so look we're big fans Monsters University what a way to kick off your Valentine's Day do it with the bromance <laughs> rather than a romance brilliant um something completely different to uh start your week um Film 4, 10.45pm. This is one of those films that I think, yeah, it's right to be on late. Um, this is uh, the film My Friend Dharma, which you might go in thinking, oh, this might sound nice. It sounds quite jolly. You're going to learn about someone who's, you know, a friendship that's growing. Oh, no, no, no. This is what we would describe as the prequel into the life of serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer. Um, it's all about his disturbed childhood, his oh gross and unhealthy obsessions um, of, uh, you know, tax. Well, is it taxidermy? Would we say it kind of goes into that? It, it yeah. kind of goes into that. I mean, to be honest, the film largely is, is him trying to survive high school, in fact, because he's sort of an outcast and makes yeah. friends and they start. It's about the relationships that form in his life. And 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 really, it's just about how this 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 mind starts to you know become what we famously know it will in the throes of adolescence in the throes yeah. of you know peer pressure and high school and popularity and things like that i mean obviously it doesn't take a genius to 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 clock that high school breeds serial killers more than anywhere else in the world i'm sure but do you know what it does, it does throw up an interesting question nature versus nurture in a way um it you does. Know, because his, his his loneliness and stuff, like, you know, he's building these things in his own mind. Like, no one's got gone there and said, look, this is how you kill someone, or should we... You know, there's no, like, internet conversations around this. This is set in the 70s, right? What this film does well is kind of gives you an introduction to Jeffrey Dahmer, if you don't know who Jeff, mm. the notorious Jeffrey Dahmer was. Um, but what it doesn't do is give you the, the thrill and excitement from, say, like, the Ted Bundy kind of... Uh, movie yeah now that's the problem and we had this with Bundy and Zac Efron to yeah. an extent as well where that was more or less a courtroom drama yeah this is a prequel and you do feel like you know it, it, it's it's the stardust problem we have this with stardust if yeah. you remember it's a moment which is if you, yeah if you're gonna give me a Bowie movie give me a Bowie movie yeah if you're gonna give me a Jeffrey Dahmer movie I want to see him doing Jeffrey Dahmer things yeah you know, I, I, I want that story because there's not been a mainstream, high-profile film about Jeffrey Dahmer. I'm frankly surprised there hasn't... I mean, there's been a Bundy movie, but yeah. again, these things aren't high-profile. And what you've got here is just a tease. I think Ross Lynch, who is the standout in the films who plays Dahmer, um, who was a Disney Channel actor. He Ooh, did a lot of Disney it. Channel movies prior to this. So there's, there's really... He's really pushing about how doing this. He's great. The problem is the film... Although it's unsettling, I don't think it has an awful lot going for it outside of that. But as a quite twisted horror drama, I think it's very good. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that. So, guys, don't go into that thinking that this is nice 
and sweet and light because it's not. It's very, it's slow paced, it unfolds and it kind of sets you up ready for wanting to Google who Jeffrey Dahmer was afterwards. Uh, that's where it's at. So that is on Film 4, 10.45 p.m. on Monday. Looking to stay in the loop with the latest movie news? Then say hello to The Daily Reel, your bite-sized hit of the biggest happenings, hirings, firings, release dates, scandals, and everything else going on behind the silver screen. Delivered to your ears every weekday morning in less time than you'll spend in the shower. Subscribe to The Daily Reel on all major podcast platforms or ask Alexa to install The Daily Reel skill for your morning flash briefing. Make your morning cinematic with The Daily Reel. Welcome back to Off Screen and of course keeping you on that couch. It's now Tuesday. So what can we recommend for our freeview viewing fans on on Tuesday then, Miss Perfect? Um America's Sweethearts, which is I think it's an early 2000s movie. Uh it's on the so- it's on Sony Movies at 5:05 p.m. Um this yeah, it came out in 2001. Great oh, class. That was a while ago, like wasn't it? I know. That was like uh that was an eagerly ago. blonde kind of time, wasn't it? it was, yeah. Uh, but it's um, you know, I love these kind of early two thousand movies because there's it's kind of it's there's it's showy but not self social media showy, right? So there's a different kind of glamour to it. Um, but this is you know this has got a power cast and it's got John Cusack, got um, Catherine Zeta Jones, Billy Crystal, Julia Roberts. What's not to like? Exactly. So I think if memory serves, I believe it's John Cusack and Catherine Zeta Jones are the Hollywood it couple. They are the you know the sort of the. Br- what do you get the Brangelina? Is that what they call it? Yeah, like the Brad and Angelina Brangelina. They were the Brangelina of their of the of their day in this fictional world, and uh, they split up, and it is left to their respective publicists, who are played by Billy Crystal and Julia Roberts, to effectively smooth over the cracks and try and preserve their client's much coveted, much adored relationship. And of course, when you think back at the time this was out, I think this came out, uh, you know, the heyday of like, you know, Britney and Justin, yeah, for instance. I think, I think <laughs> Brad and Jen had just gotten together, I think around this time as well, I want to say. Yeah. I feel like that was, I feel like this was season six of Friends kind of era. Which was was around then. So the, this was like with the dawn of the internet, we started to become a little bit more obsessed with celebrity couples than we'd ever been before. Perfect uh, film for that moment, and also a very funny one. It does have a lot of wit. Julia Roberts, I think, gets to go dry, but not quite as dry as she does in, for instance, Erin Brockovich or even Pretty Woman. But still, very good role for her. And of course. This was at a time when John Cusack being in a movie was a reason to celebrate. This was straight after uh, High Fidelity. Yeah, yeah. And, and do you know what? Like, it's funny, isn't it? Like, I, I love John Cusack. I love Joan Cusack in movies. I think they're both brilliant. I like Adam Cusack. <laughs> um, and, you know, for me, I remember seeing this like 20 years ago and actually being like, this is cool. This is what Hollywood is. This is like, this is a fun Hollywood movie, well acted. You know, it's good. It's funny in parts. It's got heart in parts. It works. It works, and it's not too, it's not too gaudy. It's not too garish. It just has the right kind of level of balance around it. You know, the really funny part about this as well is that this, uh, there's this movie, and then of course Julia Roberts got to be the actress in, you know, the the tabloid relationship. Two films previous, uh, two years previous as yeah. well in Notting Hill. The film that sits in between those is Erin Brockovich. The film that sits in between those two is the one she wins the Oscar for. And when you see America's Sweetheart, she's a very, very good movie. It's perfectly fine, perfectly yeah. likable, engaging rom-com. You know, Billy Crystal's in it. How bad could it possibly be? Um, you do sit there and you do think, it's quite obvious she didn't think she was going to win an Oscar for Erin Brockovich, because I don't think she'd have followed this followed it up with this. Otherwise, it's perfectly good, as I say. But you don't follow up your big Oscar-winning turn with America's sweethearts, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, 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 I gotcha, yeah. And, mm. but, you know what, it is what it is. What a what a triple, th- triple kind of offering, a triple threat. A triple, I think, when yeah. you get to the cast of this. Yeah, exactly. Well, no, 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 in terms of Julia Roberts' career, like, mm. triple movie, like, a run-up, it's, it's quite incredible. But, yeah, it's it's a really, it's a solid movie. I think it's quite recognisable as well. Like, as soon as you see the mm. poster, it's, it's something like the yellow jacket or something that... Um, one of the ways it just stands out there's stuff about this that really stands out for me but great run from everyone absolutely right i've just looked at the poster and Catherine zeta jones is indeed wearing a yellow jacket also billy crystal has an incredible red blazer on in that picture anyway 
beside the point. There we go. Maybe I've judged it by its poster, but I enjoyed it. I remember enjoying it. I think you guys will. It's a good one to revisit. I hope it holds up in terms of its quality over time. Actually, not only does it hold up, it almost seems tame by today's standards. Yeah. Uh, let's move on then to uh, something that's not so much tame by today's standards. Uh, Wednesday night, uh, the 17th of February. Film for 9 p.m. Do you want to tell us about Roman J. Israel, Miss Burford? Well, I just want to say first and foremost about this is when when Denzel like wants to transform into a character, he's going for the Oscar. Um, like that's what he d- he's done he's done in this. This is a film to let Denzel stretch his acting capabilities once again, and I think he was quite let down with the reception of this, and I think it's unfair uh, because it was a really really great. Oh, totally. So he plays Roman J. Israel, who is, um, he's basically, he's, he's a quirky guy who works in a law firm. <laughs> That's putting it mildly, isn't it? He's a quirky guy. He's a quirky is he on guy. The spe- is he on the spectrum? I think he he's, at one be, point yes. he's mentioned. He may well be, yes. And he basically, basically, his firm's owner suffers from a heart attack. So he then has to go in and run trials um, to, to step up to the plate. And he's just not ready for it, really. And you kind of follow... Like, I love the fact you follow him in this and he's got he's got his headphones on. He's kind of in, into himself. He's always seen as a bit of a joke. And it's not necessarily something about someone who's rising above adversity in it. He just... It, just a snapshot again isn't it of, of this particular guy's life it is now i have got a point to make about the plot but first let's 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 hear it from the big man himself civil or uncivil disobedience the first amendment to protect your right to freedom of speech as long as you don't incite violence or or law breaking and they're going to be people that get caught up in the march they're going to vandalize they're going to i'm sorry excuse me i see two sisters standing why are the sisters standing and the brother sitting if we want to sit, we can ask. Well, you ladies got to speak up for yourselves. Say 40 years ago. There's no statute of limitations on uh, chivalry. Mm. That's gendered and sexist. And polite. And patronizing. And polite. Isn't he? He's just really charming. And then the interesting thing for me about that is uh, you've synopsized the plot. And I have a different synopsis. And not only have we both seen the same film, we literally sat next to each other watching that film, if I remember correctly, Bex. Yeah. Um, it's, the problem is, it's a film that was never really marketed properly. Yeah. It's, it's a very difficult film to nail down what it is. You can't describe it as a legal thriller. You can't describe it as a comedy. You can't really describe it as a drama. It is a hodgepodge. Now, this comes from Dan Gilroy, who gave us Nightcrawler. Is it, is it Dan who gave us? Because there's Dan Gilroy and Tony Gilroy. <laughs> <laughs> it is Dan, Dan Gilroy gave us Nightcrawler. Yes, I think okay. this was the follow-up. And uh, it's interesting that this is kind of as unfocused as it is when Nightcrawler is as laser-focused as it is. Now, this is a film, for me, that's about a Faustian deal with the devil. It's about the road to hell being paved with good intentions. And that's even someone as good-natured and you know genuinely as positive as Roman J. Israel can succumb to that. Hell of a cast on it. I mean, I think Colin Farrell's Colin absolutely Farrell. brilliant. Yeah. Uh, Carmen Yogo, I think, was in there as, as well. Like Sam Gilroy turned up in this. Uh, Nazneen Contractor, I'm always happy to see in there. I think it was Nazneen Contractor who was originally being farmed out by the Church of Scientology as Tom Cruise's next wife before she opened her mouth to him. But uh, if memory serves, if I'm remembering wow. going clear, if I'm remembering going clear behind the doors of Scientology uh, correctly, it was Nazneen Contract that they tried to add to Tom Cruise's harem. Anyway, um, the film itself, though, like I say, as unfocused as it is, is still really, really good. Yeah. Like I say, Farrell's great, Carniogo's yeah. great, but Denzel, absolutely superb. And I think he did get a nomination for this, even though the film didn't really get nominated elsewhere. Yeah, but I still think there was this air of disappointment. Like, I think it wasn't... Oh, I could be wrong, but I remember kind of going, he's probably got this in the bag, and then mm. he didn't walk away with it. And I don't know if well. it was a particularly strong year, but it's maybe it's like he's, he's, he's doing the whole thing where he's just one too many. <laughs> um, it's, quite, it's quite possible. It's just well worth your time. It's, um, you know, it is one of those movies that it did some business. It won't stick in your mind. 
But if you want to see a great performance, this is one from Denzel yet again. And you know, quirky is quirky is an understatement. You're right. It is to, it is it is different. But if you're if you want to watch it for a reason of it being a courtroom drama, you're not going to get that. You have to kind of open your mind to the lateral way in which this movie plays out. But overall, it's available on Film Four nine o'clock on Wednesday and definitely, definitely worth some of your time. Right, OK, I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit for our next one, which is uh, this Thursday night, the 18th, uh, Now You See Me 2, which is on uh, Film 4, 625. Nice early evening film, and, and why not? It's a 12A-rated film, as far as I remember, uh, which sees the returning cast from the first movie, the, uh, I believe they were called The Four Horsemen. Yes. They're effectively uh, Vegas stage magicians, each one harboring a different skill. You have Isla Fisher, who's the, the sort of the, the magician's assistant type, but she's actually a sort of escape artist. Yeah. You've got Woody Harrelson, who's the con artist grifter of the group. You've got uh, Jesse Eisenberg, who's the David Blaine type. And then you've got... Uh, Dave Franco. Dave Franco? Yeah, yeah, Dave Franco. Franco. James Franco has a brother. What's his name? Dave Franco. Yes, indeed it is. Dave Franco. And this time around, not only are they being uh, pursued by the villains from the first movie, they have a new villain in the form of Daniel Radcliffe, an eccentric, loaded guy who takes them, uh, basically takes the four horsemen under his employ, whether they want to or not, and sets them about on a whole new mission that's going to involve over-the-top set pieces, ludicrous magical stunts, and, well... Compelling mystery along the way. Ta da! So happy to be working with you. Please come oh, in, come in. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait, sorry, how are you working with us? Oh, well, in as much as a magician who pulls a rabbit from a hat is working with that rabbit. We'll be working together, yes. Um, allow me to introduce myself. Yeah, you're Walter Mabry. You died a year ago. Yes, an idea I got from you, Mr. Wilder. They fake your death and the world puts its guard down. You see, you all want an audience. I, on the other hand, want the opposite of that. I just want to be, and, and I am, 100% off the grid. You know why? Yeah, because the grid is for actual human beings. <sighs> no, because in a world of total surveillance, the only true freedom lies in not being seen. Oof, wise words ahead of their time there. Oh, I really like these movies. I watched the first one over Christmas, um, re-watched it, and we watched this one at a screening together a while back, so I'll, I'd like to revisit this. Look, it's got magic, it's got big effects, it's fun, it's got a great cast. It is what it's, it does what it says on the tin, right? It is what it is. And you've just got to go in there and enjoy it as an easy watch. Um, you know, you, you know what you're going to get. It's, it's kind of, I like the fact that we see Daniel Radcliffe in this as something, you know, something different again. Uh, you know, it's, it's so hard. I do feel sorry for him. I do feel it's he's so tarnished by the Harry Potter. Harry Potter, yeah. yeah it, 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 it's nice to see him really push himself. And he is a good actor in this. And, you know, Vegas, big stunts, just what you want to see from this. Great characters, worth your watch. Absolutely. And uh, read Daniel Radcliffe, it is an outright shame that uh, the guy who made Guns Akimbo turned out to be a Me Too worthy scumbag because that movie would have been great for getting Daniel Radcliffe free of... Uh, Free of the Harry Potter marker. That film is insane. If you've never seen it, see Guns Akim. I mean, literally, guy wakes up with guns bolted through his hands, being hunted to death. It's just a great movie. Um, wearing bear slippers as well, which is even better. So, uh, on to... Uh, oh, I will say this about Now You See Me Too, by the way. A little bit more far-fetched than the first one. The yeah. first one does kind of make sense. The second one pushes it a bit far. There's one plot twist in particular that I was just like, really? Yeah. Involves, involves Woody Harrelson, if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, but look, overall, enjoyable. Take it with a pinch of salt. Yeah, yeah. Other than that, perfectly fine, perfectly engaging. Uh, really quickly then, Friday night to end the week, BBC One, Friday the 19th, 8.25pm. It's Steve Coogan and John C. Riley as the most iconic comedy duo, I would say. Of uh, of the first half of the twentieth century, it's uh, it's Stan and Ollie. Yeah. Uh, do you want to take us through Stan and Ollie next? Yeah, this is a lovely film. This is a gentle film as well, so it's great that it's on. It's it's perfect for being on BBC One um, at uh, eight twenty five pm. It is. Um, it's not your big Friday night blockbuster. It is a lovely glimpse into the later lives of. Um, Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy, and they're played brilliantly by Steve Coogan and John C. Riley. And um, you know, this is this is a moment where the the big fame of of Laurel and Hardy has kind of been and gone, and mm. they are now in sort of more twilight years where they want to kind of revive their their 
their stardom. So they go round the music halls. I think this is in the late 50s, early 60s, this happens. And they're trying it's to... It's around sort of the Blackpool kind of way. Yeah. Isn't it? It's around it Blackpool sort of area they go at one point, yeah. Yeah. And they basically go and play those and try, try and bring back, you know, the, the, the magic that was of the golden age. Um, but unbeknownst to, to, to both of them, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's Oliver Hardy, isn't he? He's, he's very poorly... In this, and so we're seeing kind of the demise of Oliver Hardy, even though that what's happening is is that he's trying to to refrain from showing that off because ever the showman, the show must go on. Well, I think there is the there's that loyalty thing as well. I think he just doesn't want to leave uh, yeah. leave his partner sort of on his own. I, I think it's a re- it's a really touching movie. Uh, there was a really in- it's interesting thing about a year or so later when Judy came out, and you realised they were kind of the same movie. Yeah, like even down to the fact that you know doing the music halls kind of thing so there's, there's there's that going for it but I do think I actually think this is a better movie than Judy was largely because once you took the performance out of Judy there wasn't really an awful yes. lot going for it but uh, and also here's a question since Renee Zellweger won that Oscar how many people have ever remembered that Judy exists yeah exactly no I'm with hmm. you I'm with you yeah Anyway, so that is Stan and Ollie. That's going to finish off your Friday night at uh, 8.25, BBC One, gently easing you into the following weekend. So there you go. Um, so we'll be back next uh, on our next block for you with your DVD Blu-rays and, of course, your streaming. Welcome back to Off Screen. Yes, we are still staying with you on that couch. And this time we are bringing you your DVDs, your Blu-rays, and of course, the rest of your streaming offerings as well. Um, we're going to, to the dark side a little bit now. We're going to DC uh, and we're going to the world of Batman again. Is there, There's a new Batman. What's going on? It's animated, to be fair. This is part of the ongoing series of, of uh, Wonder Woman animation feature uh, Batman movies. This one's called Soul of the Dragon. And this is... An odd one. This is kind of what we call an. This is what we call an Elseworlds. You know, like this isn't part of you know the story of Batman. This is just Batman in a random story that doesn't have any bearing on continuity. Right. So else they're called Elseworlds in Marvel. They're called What If, but um, you know it, 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 because the formula is literally well, What If? You know, this happened. In this case, it's you know DC's version of What If is What If Batman was involved in a 1970s kung fu adventure. What? And that's and that is literally what this is. Hence the clever title, Soul of the Dragon. So this is anime style animation. It looks like a work of anime, maybe not quite as precise, a little bit more uh, blunt, as it were, a little bit blunter lines, not quite as artistic. Um, Batman goes uh, on a quest to uh, to find his missing martial arts teacher in the 1970s. It's uh, directed by Sam Liu, who does all of these kind of things. Uh, David Gentoli is uh, Bruce Wayne, but the big uh, star power here is kind of in the supporting cast, which includes Mark Cascos as the brilliantly named Richard Dragon, which means his name is Dick Dragon. <laughs> Kelly Hu as uh, Lady Shiva. James Hong. I love James Hong. Remember James Hong? For, he's, he's Cassandra's dad in the Wayne's World movies. Yes! Yeah, yes! you know. Well, I thought I recognised that name. My daughter. Yes. Yeah, James Hong. Uh, Kung Fu Panda's dad. Oh. King's dad in Kung Fu Panda. You know, the, the is he a goose? Yeah, him. Know. Oh, James Hong. One. Amazing. There's a there's a petition afoot to get him a star on the Walk of Fame. I've, I've signed yes. and paid money to it. Um, Ke- uh, Michael J. White is in this as well. Jamie Chung turns up. Robin Atkin Downs, who is one of the stalwarts of, of uh, modern uh, animated voiceover work, as well as Gray Griffin as well. There is a hell of a cast of this. The film itself isn't great, though. Okay. I wasn't overly taken in by it. I, I struggle with Elseworld things anyway. There's some that are undeniably brilliant. Is it just uh, too super- far-fetched? Is it just too bonkers? It's not even that. It's just, once you remove the the quintessentially Batman-like elements from a Batman story, and it is just Batman in a different story, it, it stops being quite as, as, as thrilling. A good part of the fun of Batman is always... It's Batman's world. Even the yeah. wider DC world is usually Batman's world. Uh, the one I always name, for instance, Superman Red Sun, as one of my favourite Elseworld tales, uh, imagines what would happen if Superman had crash-landed in Russia rather than the US. Mm. And yeah. okay. like that's what you use an Elseworlds tale for. 1970s Kung Fu Batman it doesn't make a whole heap of sense. 
I almost feel like yeah, like Green Lantern would have made more sense in this kind of context because at yeah. least he could magic up a sword when he wants, you know. There's there's that going for. He could literally magic up a dragon if he wants. Batman doing it. I can see where the inspiration comes from because there is a you ninja know, element within Batman. But other than that, no. Yeah, because when the, okay, just sorry, just linking back to like the Christian Bale mm. Batman's. Yeah. There is a ninja part in that, is that right? Yeah, yeah, Batman is a trained ninja. That's one of his many skills is having been trained by the uh, the League of Assassins. The League, yeah, League of yeah. Ass- League of Assassins. They're called, they're called yeah. the called League of Shadows. They're called League of Shadows in Nolan's version. In the comics and the Arrowverse, they are the League of Assassins. Yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. they're always run by Ra's al Ghul or Ra's yeah. al Ghul in the yeah. comics and the series. Ra's al Ghul. Um, yeah. He's Ra's in the... He's, he's spelt Ra's and he's called Ra's in Nolan's movies. He's Raish everywhere else and there's a gag about it in, in Batman Begins as well where someone mispronounces him as Raish al Ghul. But uh, I say, this is one for the aficionados only. Like, if you're okay. a completist, by all means, go nuts. But the Bat fans, if you're coming off of, like, you know, one of your Arkham games, you just finished watching Batman vs. Superman, you want something to keep the good times rolling, this ain't it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Shall we move swiftly on, then? Because I, I, we're, we're, the offering that we've got on DVD and Blu-ray um, it moves on to something that, again, I wasn't overly taken by, it, and I know that there's huge fans of this movie out there. So we're talking about The Secret Garden. Uh, yeah, but not fans of this movie specifically. There are fans out there of the movie before this. Yes, yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> that seems right, to be the problem. That is the problem. And this, I just remember when we watched this, you know, not too long ago. It's just three very, or four months ago? Yeah, three or four months ago. But it's very. I found it very, very dark. <laughs> I found it very dark. Not like metaphorically dark or anything like that, or atmospherically dark. It's just generally quite dark inside the house. And then obviously... It is. It's, uh, the garden it's not wonderfully lit, is it? No, it's not. And I think, you know, it's kind of a cliche cliche kind of role for Colin Firth. It doesn't really excite me in the way. And I think for anyone that was a big fan of the original... This is not gonna. This is not gonna do it justice for you. Well, since you've mentioned him, let's let's have a little listen to Mr. Firth. Mrs. Medlock says you're cluttering up the place. She'd have me send you away to school. I don't want that, sir. I like it here. Then we will find you a governess. No, I've no need of a governess. I've too much to learn here at Misselthwaite, sir. This place has nothing to teach you. I want to play out of doors. It's too hot to do so in India. I'm obliged by law to have you taught. And we'll need to break the law, won't we? Yeah, this just really isn't a great uh, a great adaptation. Um, there's some changes made to the story that I've always known that uh, just don't quite work as well as I think they do. I have uh, friends, funnily enough, all women, who took real issue with this movie. Uh, my friends Jess and Corey, for instance, had significant problems with, <laughs> hilariously enough, one of the uh, one of the young uh, boys in the movie not being fanciable enough for his uh, for his character, which is an interesting choice. Well, no, Me, but I, I can, thought there was I can some... understand I can understand that because the, your friends will have grown up with mm. like this fantasy in their head of this young boy that they would watch from the first adaptation or what they would have read about you know and made it up and then if it doesn't deliver yeah it, it, I get it I get it totally well for me I mean my problem with the uh, with some of the uh, the uh, performers in it was that they were terrible I mean there are some absolutely atrocious child performances in this like I know they will have toured every stage school in the country trying out the the pupils one by one for this movie because you know it's the latest version of Secret Garden of course they would but they did definitely not find this country's finest thesps for this one so yeah. just be warned going into it anyway Secret Garden and Batman Soul of the Dragon two that you might be better off skipping out on DVD and Blu-ray from Monday 15th of February. On to stream Vex and on uh, Tuesday the 16th, a movie I know you're excited to talk about for the media oh. that we can talk about it. We haven't got a clip anyway. Uh, let's talk then about our yeah. new arrival on Netflix. It's Bird on a Wire from 1990. Oh my goodness. So this is Goldie Horn. This is Mel Gibson kind of in the height of his lethal weapon sort of fame. Um, and this is an action comedy movie. It's under two hours long, which is fantastic. Um, and Mel Gibson plays uh, Rick, 
who is given basically a new identity by the FBI because he helped convict a drug dealing FBI agent. So his minder is then replaced by a corrupt agent who helps bring the bring the helps the drug dealers and his accomplice to locate him. So it's you know look this is this is your pure 90s like 80s moving into 90s kind of territory and the heyday of the greats. You know this is what I love Goldie Hawn in her absolute heyday with this. Well that's it. I mean this being 1990 this was the meeting of two huge stars. Like yeah. I know it's weird to it's weird to think now, but like Goldie Hahn Goldie Hahn, Catherine Hahn and Goldie Hawn. Very different people. Um why is everyone Catherine today? I don't know why. Uh Goldie Hawn was a huge star back then. Yeah. I mean, especially coming out of like the eighties and I think at this point, this is just before she does uh House Sitter with Steve Martin. Um her and she and Mel Gibson doing a movie together was a huge, huge deal. deal. Yeah, huge. that's like that. It, it was up there with like Michael Douglas and, and <laughs> Kathleen Turner, <laughs> another, another Kath, Kathleen Turner. Um, it was up there with that for a pairing, or to put it in something modern context, like uh, Chris Hemsworth and Tessa Thompson. Yeah, or well, again, Brad and Angelina. That kind of a, a pairing. Good movie. Um, that's right. I mean, I like it because I think the relationship angle that it plays, which is largely from Goldie Hawn's point of view, she's the kind of jilted girlfriend. The jilted ex-girlfriend who has the ex come back into her life as this, you know, he's on the run, witness protection, fugitive type. And it's a really, really good movie. You know, um, do you know what? Do you know what? I, I I hate to say this. I think I saw an interview, or and this is a while back, so don't quote me on it. I don't think that Goldie Horn and Mel Gibson actually got on with this, with each other in this. Oh, um, I can believe it. I can yeah. absolutely believe it. But I yeah. do think, though, for there's a showcase for the talents of the pair. I think Horn was kind of on the way out by this point. Like, this is half a decade before First Wives Club, which yeah. kind of signals a re- an almost retirement movie for it. She kind of goes away after uh, First Wives Club. But for Mel Gibson, this is like peak. This is yeah. pinnacle. This is ha- half a decade before Goldie Horn more or less retires. It's half a decade before he wins an Oscar for Braveheart. Yeah. So, you know, for directing Braveheart. But I do think a really solid, visceral, you know, uh, sort of stan- tan- uh, 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 tangible 90s thriller, I think. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? We all could do with a really good throwback to, to, to better times, I think. And this is a perfect example of this. Now, moving on to Netflix again, um, there is a movie that you have a T-shirt about, which, uh, <laughs> that, and it is this movie. And you know, I've not seen this movie yet. Um, and maybe now that it comes on Netflix, I might treat myself to watching um, it. I'm John Wicking you back. because that's what okay. it is. I'm just going to keep including it until you've watched it. Yeah. That's how this is going. We did this with John Wick one. We're going to do it with the Meg until you watch the Meg because the sequel is coming. That okay. sequel's coming in the next two years. I just remember I the posters. If, I just remember. Yeah, I don't posters. remember if Ben Wheatley's still directing it or not because he dropped out of Tomb Raider two quite quietly. Um, but he was doing two sequels. We were doing Tomb Raider two and the Meg two, or or two M two Egg. I don't know. But uh, presumably, in which they return to the underwater underwater world that we discover in this movie when a research station, an underwater research station, happens to break the seal at the bottom of the Mariana Trench and discover that there is actually another ocean underneath our ocean and because no man has no no human being has entered this ocean ever the natural life there is undisturbed including a full-size megalodon a prehistoric shark about 50 feet long that then gets loose into our ocean and sets about destroying asia as only jason statham can wonderfully sum up she's coming Oh boy. It was the largest shark that ever existed. Thought to have been extinct for two million years. The thing's out there. We need to find it and kill it. Why don't you just put a tracker on it? Did you guys ever watch Shark Week? Megalodon. Yeah. Is that Megalodon? That's a real thing, yes. There was a, there was a prehistoric shark called a megalodon. That's a real thing. That's what they shortened to the Meg. There's a wonderful moment in the film in which Jason in which Jason Statham just casually starts referring to it as the Meg for the first time. And not one person in a room full of scientists, including Ruby Rose, thinks to turn around and ask, whoa, 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 hang on a minute. When, when did we all sign off on this? We're calling it the Meg now? Oh, okay. 
fair. I mean, the film was originally, didn't have a the before. It was just called Meg at one point, but... Uh, eh. Which led to all sorts of Family Guy comparisons. But I think this is a great, fun, trashy exploitation B-picture dressed up as a $150 million visual effects-laden Jason Statham action vehicle. It's a lot of fun. It's clearly intended to make money in China as well, because a yep. large chunk of it takes place in China. A couple of the cast, prominent cast members are Chinese. So, yeah, so they were, they were quite clearly hedging their bets with this one. It obviously made enough money. So we're getting another one. But in the meanwhile, it's going to be on Netflix from Wednesday the 17th. I can't recommend highly enough that you check out The Meg, Miss Perfect. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, I will. I promise I will. I will. I probably need a trashy movie. That's probably what I'm after. So. <laughs> oh, he's trashy. He's trashy. Oh, it's totally yeah. trashy. Yeah. yeah. Now, our final film that we're talking about today, I cannot believe it did the business that it did. Right, but oh, okay. this, well, yeah, no, I kind of can, but I, I like me going really for that. It did this. What? Uh, it's kind you, of the, the. You know how many Asian school children there are in the world, right? Uh, yeah, I'm one of them. Um... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was just gonna say. <laughs> Wait, you're a school child. I was once, and I grew up. <laughs> I grew up playing Sonic the Hedgehog. What I didn't grow up hoping is to see <laughs> is to see Jim Carrey as Dr. Robotnik. <laughs> you know what you know what no, I grew up not expecting to see? I never expected to grow up seeing the movie Hop remade with its actual same star and Sonic the Hedgehog, which is what yeah. you get here when James Marsden is the human who's forced to team up with Sonic the Hedgehog, is now a live action movie with a CG Sonic who's voiced by Ben Schwartz. Uh, they, they replaced the visual effects uh, after releasing the trailer because there was a massive outcry about how terrible he looked. Um, and you've got Jim Carrey as Robotnik, who uh, I think... Uh, is his name Kinterball Robotnik? Because I think Kinterball yeah. is what he's originally called his origin story because it's, it's Robotnik yeah. backwards. Um, Kinterball Robotnik or whatever, he was a government consultant who sets about hunting Sonic the Hedgehog when he is stranded in our world attempting to just simply live his life without being troubled by the human race. I'm wet, I'm cold, there's a fish on my head, and clearly I'm not gonna be able to do this on my own. All right, get in the truck. Really? You're gonna help me? I guess it is a little bit my fault that all this is happening to you. Not a little bit, entirely. It is entirely your okay, fault. It's entirely my fault. Are you coming? Yes. Road trip! Whoop whoop! What am I doing? Ah, uh, like. <laughs> so... Are you not a fan? Did you not like it at all? No, because. Oh, okay. No. Like, I kind of go, look, if you want to see Jim Carrey beat Jim Carrey, you know, in his, like, slapstick out there kind of thing, that's exactly what you're going to get. It was too. I don't know. I don't know what I didn't like about it. I like the James Marsden Sonic relationship was, was fine. Um, Jim Carrey, it just, I yeah, it bored me. I just didn't enjoy it. I just didn't enjoy it. And I'm flabbergasted that so many people did. I I mean, I'll be really honest with you. I think, it, I think it's better than it has any right to be. Because yeah. if you're not going to do the plot of the Sonic games, which this in no way does, yeah. uh, then of all the plots you, you could come up with, I suppose basically remaking Hop with the same exact cast member is about as good as you could really hope. Um, if anything, it's more of an origin story for Robotnik than anything else. Yeah. We, yeah. We've had word in literally the last 12 hours that Sonic the Hedgehog, the sequel, is in fact going to be cleverly entitled Sonic the Hedgehog 2, and will specifically pick up from a post credit scene in this one. But if you want to see that scene for yourself and figure out what's going to come... Well, you're going to have to watch the first one first, and it's on Amazon Prime, as you say, from Thursday the 18th. It's the third most successful film, I think, of 2020. Oh, my God. I don't know why. <laughs> I think it's the 800, Bad Boys for Life, and then Sonic the Hedgehog, and then I think it's either Onward or Birds of Prey comes after that. For me, you've kind of left a little bit of a sour taste for me because we started <laughs> with a genre that I'm not that interested in, i.e. Westerns, and you've ended with... You know, I did Sonic love Sonic the Hedgehog. Hedgehog, but I don't love the film. So thanks for that, Van. Really nice and thoughtful from you. Hopefully next Before... week we can come back with something better. 
<laughs> before we go then, before we go, and incidentally, we have no idea what's out next week because the release dates are in such flux at the moment. Um, but if you had to, if you had a gun to your head and you had to pick watching Sonic the Hedgehog again, or the, the Bob Hoskins Super Mario Brothers movie from 1993, or the Scott Wolf, Mark DeCascos, Double Dragon movie, or the Kristana Loken Blood Rain movie. Which of those video game movies do you pick? So easy! Super Mario every single time. Oh my god. Oh, oh, oh. wow. Oh, I, say, I have no shame in loving that movie. Oh. I have no shame in loving that movie. It is, <laughs> I love it. A Nintendo fan through and through, taking it to that movie. I watched it as a kid. I enjoyed it. John Leguizamo, Bob Hoskins, Dennis Qu- uh, Hopper, perfect. See you later. Hey, this has been off. If it had been, if it had been Dennis Quaid, I would have been amused. That's all I'm gonna say. I almost said it, but I I managed to steer myself back. Um, now I now I feel better about ending the show. There we go. That's fine. There you okay. go. <laughs> Guys, thanks for sticking with us. This has been off screen. We've been taking you through your seven day guide to everything movies. We'll be back again next week. But for now, I've been Bex Perfect. I've been Van Connor and we... Sh- <laughs>